welcome everyone to the Buddhist Ministry Initiative Spring Speaker. Um, our speaker tonight is David Loy. David is a Zen teacher, a lecturer, and an author. He was the Bessel Family Chair of Ethics and Religion and Society at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio from 2006 to 2011. Before that, he served as a professor of philosophy at Bonkyo University in Shigasaki, Japan from 1991 through 2005. And in 1971, he began practicing Zen with Robert Aitken Roshi in Hawaii and is authorized, an authorized teacher in the Sanbo Kyodan lineage of Zen Buddhism, where he completed formal koan training under Zen master Yamada Kun Roshi. David lectures, did I do that right? Kun Roshi? Hmm? How do Cohen Roshi, okay. David lectures nationally and internationally on various topics, focusing primarily on the encounter between Buddhism and modernity, what each can learn from the other. He's especially concerned about social and ecological issues. And I first met uh, David, actually, at the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies, and I, I drove out there just to have tea with him because I had read some of his writings online and in his books and was inspired to hear a Buddhist teacher talk about um, the environment and Buddhism so eloquently. And then later, um, when we sponsored an Eco Dharma conference in 2012 at um, a retreat center that I'm affiliated with, Wonderwell Mountain Refuge. David came and he spoke again very eloquently about this uh, the need for the Buddhist community to step up and to uh, be vocal on the issue of the environment and ethics, and sustainability. So um, please join me in welcoming David to talk tonight about why Buddhism and the modern world need each other. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Miller, for the kind, warm, generous introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Not so pleased to be behind this podium. I find there's something kind of dualistic about it, but uh, I was informed this is where the mic is, and so uh, I'll make the best of it. Maybe it's a metaphor for institutional constraints, something like that. Uh, although I do notice there is a, another mic here. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, because of the recording, too, so uh, I'll start out here and see if I start to wander. Um, about 50 years ago, uh, the Zen poet Gary Snyder published an essay on Buddhist anarchism that included these words, quote, the mercy of the West has been social revolution. The mercy of the East has been insight into the basic self slash void. We need both, unquote. Another way to say that, I think, is that the highest ideal of the Western tradition has been social justice, the idea that we can restructure, reconstruct our societies to make them more socially just, more equitable. Uh, and I emphasize the word ideal because I think probably all of us in this room are very aware of the shortcomings. And in some ways, we seem to be moving in the opposite direction when you think about the growing gap between rich and poor. But nonetheless, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge and keep in mind what has been accomplished in the modern era in just a few hundred years, right? You think of uh, uh, 
political revolutions, the establishment of democracies, bills of rights, anti-slavery campaigns, um, more recently, women's rights, civil rights movements, gay rights, um, even animal rights now. Hmm? So again, a lot to appreciate there. On the other side, though, looking at, looking at the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist tradition, as it has developed in Asia, really hasn't had a lot to say about social justice. That hasn't been a primary concern. Rather, the concern, we can say, if the concern of the West has been social transformation, the emphasis of the Buddhist tradition is personal or individual transformation, that we can realize something about ourselves, about the world, about our relationship with the world that transforms how we personally live in the world. And when Gary Snyder says we need both, I think he's right. Not just because those two go well together, but I think we're in a time now where we can see that those two projects actually need each other if they're going to be as successful as we need them to be. So that's really what I'm gonna to try to persuade you, that right now, at this globalization moment when East and West are certainly coming together. We're learning so much about other traditions. One of the important things we need to do is see how these two ideals, or let's even call them projects, can, can work together. And I think not too soon, given the kind of ecological, economic, social crises that we face today, too. So I want to start out by contrasting the spiritual roots of the West, that is to say, the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, on the one side with the Buddhist tradition in terms of their different attitudes toward morality. Uh, and here I'm not so much concerned about the content of their moral systems, but more about the difference in their function. I mean, as we would expect if you compare the Ten Commandments with the five Buddhist precepts, there are some similarities and there are some differences. That's not what I'm so interested in. Rather, I'm concerned about the role that morality plays within the, Abraham, the Abrahamic traditions, Judeo-Christianity in particular, and, and in Buddhism. Because it seems to me, to start the comparison, that the duality between good and evil is very central. It's the central axis or the central duality of the Abrahamic traditions. Hmm? It's like, what's God's main way of uh, communicating or relating to us? Well, in a way, he tells us how to live, or he, she, it tells us how to live. And likewise, our main responsibility to God is living according to uh, what God has to say, um, with the implication that if we do that, somehow he will reward us, take care of us, and if we don't, we're going to get into trouble. In fact, we can see this duality between good and evil. I mean, for many rather conservative Judeo-Christians, they would see this world as a kind of a battleground you know, between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And the really important issue is our will. Where do we stand? On which side are we allied? I think this goes all the way back to the very beginnings of the Judeo-Christian tradition, back to the Garden of Eden and the story of Adam and Eve. Um, that's a fascinating myth, and it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. For me, what stands out is it seems to be some kind of statement about the development of self-consciousness, right? You remember that when they eat the forbidden fruit, they become aware that they're naked, and they sort of get fig leaves and hide from the face of God. It's almost as if that's a, a metaphor for the development of a self-consciousness, which is also the development of a sense of separation a sense of distance, right? Insofar as I become self-conscious, I become aware of that which I am not, and there's, some more, there's more of a problematic relationship that comes out of that. But that's not the way the story is told to us, right? That's not what's emphasized anyway. What's emphasized is that it's a sin, that they disobeyed God, that they did something that God didn't want us to do. It's a fascinating story. There's a lot else we could look at, but just skimming right through the Judeo-Christian tradition, Moses, uh, no, not Moses, uh, Noah's Ark. Again, why did God decide to drown uh, almost all animals and human beings? 
because we weren't living in the way that he wanted us to. Bit of an overreaction, I think. Uh, for example, and I wonder too, you know, only two animals, or only two examples, right? Were all the other animals so evil? And, and especially, what about the evil fish? They got away easy, it seems to me, right? Right? So, I'm not sure how it works as a story, but clearly, the point is made, God wasn't happy. Um, and then going on to Moses, the heart of the Jewish tradition in a way, um, God gives us the Ten Commandments, and uh, there's a covenant created in, 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 in relationship, or are accepting them and sort of agreeing to live with them. He, he will take care of us in some way. Uh, actually, <laughs> this is a little peripheral, but some years ago, I was uh, at the Institute, Institute for Advanced Study in Jerusalem for a little while, and uh, it was very interesting hanging out with a bunch of archaeologists there who, uh, who told me some parts of the story that you may not have heard about the story of Moses when he came down from the uh, mountain the second time. Uh, he gathered the Israelites together and he said, uh, I've got uh, good news and bad news. The good news is I've got them down to 10. The bad news is adultery is still in. It was actually fun chatting with these guys and going around with them because uh, they also informed me that there's absolutely no archaeological evidence for the existence of Moses. As far as they're concerned, he never existed. But that's another story. Um, let's go on. So Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, Moses, Jesus. You all know a lot more about Jesus than I do. But again, although he has a more intimate relationship, I think, with with God, the Father, Abba. Uh, and with some help from Paul, he emphasizes love uh, more than in the earlier tradition, as far as I understand. But still, he's an apocalyptic Jewish prophet who's emphasizing, you know, the last days are coming and we really better behave ourselves. So anyway, that's my argument about the centrality of the duality of good and evil. That's sort of the central issue for the Judeo-Christian tradition. And you may wonder, why am I going on about this in a talk that's supposed to be about, uh, about Buddhism? Here's the point. Even in the modern world, the secular world, where many of us do not believe in that kind of God anymore, nonetheless, that duality between good and evil remains our favorite story. It's like that's the spectacles through which we still prefer to see the world. And if you just think about it a moment, think about stories literally. Think about films. I grew up with uh, James Bond. Uh, I mean, every James Bond movie, think what's going on there. But every major series since then, uh, Star Wars, um, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. Hmm? What, a, what am I leaving out? I'm sure you can think of a few others here. Uh, and of course, not just films, our favorite detective stories, uh, TV series, the good guys against the bad guys. We, we love that story. Um, and it's a fun story in lots of ways. Um, but the problem from a Buddhist perspective is that this spectacles, this way of looking at the world, although it is wonderful in some ways, it's also very problematical in some others. Um, or if, if I want to be cute, I could say something like the, the, uh, the duality between good and evil is itself both good and evil. So I want to spend a few minutes sort of unpacking that, uh, starting with the problematical side. As I think you know, Buddhism has a lot to say about how our ways of thinking uh, confuse or delude us. Uh, as my favorite bumper sticker has it, don't believe everything you think. Um, and one of the ways in which thinking problematizes the world for us is dualistic thinking. That is to say, thinking in bipolar categories. And by that, I th I'm thinking of things like hot, cold, big, small, um, uh, white, black, 
the problem with this dualism is both logical and psychological in that we think that there are two concepts involved here, but actually they're two sides of the same concept. For example, if you don't know what the word hot means, you don't really understand what the, world cold, what the word cold means. They're really two sides of the same concept, right? And in many, maybe most cases, this is fairly innocuous, it's not problematical, but there are some cases where it is because we want one rather than the other, and it's the nature of that bipolarity that you can't have one without the other. You, you, you gotta have both. And the example that I would give is, the first example would be something like purity, impurity. If it's important for you to live a pure life, and again, that can mean anything you want it to. It, in a way, it doesn't matter. But if it's important for you to live a pure life, what that means is that you will be preoccupied with impurity. That is to say, with avoiding impurity. You can't simply be p impure. You've got to discriminate situations and say, is this a pure action? Is this a pure response or not? You have this constant decision. So you can't have one lens without the other is the point, which is why one of the great Shan masters, I think it was Hui Hai, said, true purity is to live beyond the duality of purity and impurity. But the most problematical duality or bipolarity of all, I think, is the bipolarity between good and evil. Uh, and in this case, the way it works, I think, is that they're, they're their non-duality really means that we don't know what is good until we know what's evil. And we can't feel that we are good. If we want to feel that we are good, what does it mean to be good? It means that you're fighting against the evil. I think this helps to explain sort of the, the, the role of Satan, right? How, how can you have a, a perfectly good God, you know, all good, all knowing, all loving. But how do you explain all the problems? So you postulate a Satan. And although he is in some sense subordinate to God, God is all powerful, you still need a kind of duality there. It doesn't really actually work very well theoretically or theologically, but, uh, but you need something, but you need something like that. Um, let's go back to the example of James Bond. Uh, I remember when the first James Bond movies came out, they were quite, quite distinctive because he wasn't the kind of classic type hero. He had some bad sort of self-indulgent habits, right? You remember? I mean, you know, he likes to drink a lot. He likes to gamble, you know. He has casual relations with a lot of women most of whom seem to die somewhere along the line in the film, right? So how do we know he's a good guy? There's one main reason, because he is fighting against the bad guys. That's what makes him a good guy, right? And this, I think, is really important in terms of, of the way we understand stand things. Um, I think we can apply it, for example, to the war on terror. Um, what was the difference between Osama bin Laden and President George W. Bush? I think they were both engaged in the same holy war of good against evil. Of course, the valence is reversed. What the one thinks is good, the other thinks is evil. But they're still thinking of themselves as good, and it's the mark of their good that they are working to destroy what they see as evil. And that, that's part of the complication, or that's part of what's dangerous. Once you've successfully labeled something as evil, once you've decided something is evil, there's really no need to understand it or, or relate to it except to destroy it. That's the whole point. Something, if something is evil, it needs to be destroyed. I think that's the way it tends to work. I think this gives us a lot of insight into the history of the West, into things like uh, inquisitions, heresy trials, witchcraft trials, and so forth. But I don't think we need to go so far back. I also think it gives us insight into some of the horrendous events of the 20th century. For example, what was Hitler doing? when he tried to eliminate all the Jews in Europe. He wanted to kill them all, and the, the Romani and, and the homosexuals. What was he trying to do? He was trying to purify the earth 
by getting what he considered to be the imp to destroying what he considered to be the impure elements. Hmm? Or we could say he was eliminating what he thought was evil in order to sort of perfect this world. Reminding me of one of the great German poets, what was it, Holderlin, who said the, the attempt to make a heaven on this earth is what has made it into a hell. Maybe that's part of the logic there behind it. What's the basic point here? What am I getting at by looking at this problematic side? Well, one way to sum it up as a kind of general principle is something like this. One of the main causes of evil in our world has been our attempts to destroy evil or what we think of as evil, what we understand as evil. And it's not just Hitler. Think of Stalin with the kulaks in the Soviet Union, the uh, slightly wealthier peasants, or Mao Zedong uh, in China with the landlords, or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia with anyone who was educated, anyone who had uh, any, um, anyone basically who wasn't a peasant. Hmm? Please. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not defending Hitler in the least. I'm just talking about this dualistic way of thinking, how it was that he himself was acting out of it. You know, he thought he was doing something good by fighting against what he believed to be evil. He's simply an example of that. And I see that as kind of a general principle that I think has uh, you know, been very important in the history of the West generally uh, and has been the source of, of a lot of suffering from a Buddhist perspective. So that, that to me is the problematical side. Now let me go on and talk about the positive side that'll maybe hopefully relieve some of your anxieties. And that brings us back to the Old Testament or the, or the Jewish Bible, uh, back to the prophets. What were the prophets doing? Well, one of the things they were certainly doing is that they were speaking to rulers. They were going up to the kings and the rulers, and they were challenging them. They were saying, look, you're not living in the way that God wants you to. You're not obeying his rules. You are uh, taking advantage, exploiting the widows, the orphans, the poor, and so forth. And then they would run back into the hills, usually. You've got to get away from the kings after you've been challenging them like that. And this was the beginning of something really important. The notion that this whole concern for good and evil isn't something that rulers are immune to, immune from. That rulers too are subject to the same good, good demand, demands, the same ethical demands for justice. And this therefore applies not just to their subjects, but it applies to the state. It applies to the government. And this becomes very important when we combine this Judeo-Christian concern for social justice with what the Greeks realized. And by no accident, of course, the Greeks are the other uh, source of the Western tradition. Because the Greeks realized that the way we live together, the kind of social organization, is not natural in the way that our ecosystems are. That if we don't like the way we're if we don't like the way our society is structured, we can restructure it. And they were the ones who, who started to do that. They're the ones who created democracy. Not a very good democracy by our standards, but uh, nonetheless, uh, they sort of showed us something. So what happens in the modern world, it seems to me, is you have this realization we can transform our society with the Judeo-Christian concern for social justice, and we get the kind of institutional reforms that I was alluding to at the very beginning of my talk. And it's been very important. This is that social justice idea that we can restructure how we live together in order to make it more equitable, more just. Right? And because of that, we now live in a perfect society, right? Right? 
Well, not quite, not quite. The ideal's wonderful and important, but we're not quite there yet, if we ever will be, right? And here's the interesting question, why not? Is there something holding us back? What's the limitation? Or maybe I can try to put it this way. Supposing all of us were living in the most perfect possible society, the best political and economic system, whatever that would mean. If, however, you and I individually were still motivated by what Buddhism calls the three poisons, greed, ill will, and delusion, if our minds were still full of that, would that society work well? Or wouldn't it be the case that somehow, sooner or later, probably sooner, subvert subversive things would happen? People would find ways to take advantage of that system, and in certain ways it would break down. And I wonder, is that a parable for what's been happening? Or to put it another way, suppose that you are a revolutionary leader who has overthrown some really nasty dictator. And so now you have complete power. But if you haven't worked on your own greed, it's going to be rather difficult overcoming this tendency to take advantage of your new situation. If you haven't worked on your own ill will, you're likely going to look at people who have other ideas about how things should be done, how society should be structured. The tendency will be to see them as somehow enemies that need to be neutralized one way or the other, right? And if you haven't worked on your own delusion, your own ego, that I'm, you know, you're the wise one, and, uh, you, and that the solution to all of society's ills is simply imposing your vision on the to society, because you have the wisdom, right? Is that really going to be a solution? I mean, what's going to happen to that new revolutionary society? How well is that going to work? And does that help us understand why so often revolutions simply lead to one gang of thugs being replaced by another? I think you can see where I'm going with this. The ideal of social justice is wonderful. The ideal of structural transformation, passing laws, reform movements, it's essential, fantastic. But the limitation there is individual people. Just to change the institutional structure, how we actually live together, won't be, and I would argue can't be enough, unless there's also some realization and emphasis on personal individual transformation as well. Which brings me to the second part of my talk, the Buddhist tradition. I started out by wanting to contrast the perspective of the Abrahamic tradition toward morality with the Buddhist tradition. So, let, so let's look at that for the moment. Obviously, ethics, social morality is very important in Buddhism too. And it, it definitely provides a foundation there. Nonetheless, it seems to me that it's not central in the same way that, the, that good versus evil is for the Abrahamic traditions. If, you, if you're looking for something that's comparable, I think it's closer to talk, I think it works better to talk about the polarity between delusion and wisdom or ignorance and awakening. That is, the found, that, that is the foundational, that is the core duality within the Buddhist tradition. There's need for morality as kind of a function, uh, as kind of a foundation, but it seems to me the precepts become something like the training wheels on a bicycle. Very helpful when you're learning to ride, but sooner or later you can take them off, right? Be, and in principle, at least, that's the attitude in Buddhism that if one really develops, if one really awakens, then you don't have to follow the precepts as some sort of formal rules because the transformation, the awakening that you've experienced means that you will not be inclined to want to live in ways that would disobey or, or um, break those precepts. It's simply that's not something that you would want to naturally do. So you don't have to worry about them as something external. 
those guidelines are kind of sort of built into what it means to be awakened. In principle, interesting to look at why it doesn't always work out that way, but that's a discussion for another time. So what corresponds to the concern, if we have this Western concern for social justice, what's the Buddhist equivalent? Is it karma? In a way, you might think so, right? I mean, karma is kind of, it's not really, strictly speaking, good and evil, but it's sort of moral cause effect, that sort of what you do comes back to you sooner or later, right? Um, the problem with that, however, is that when you look at the way that karma has actually been functioning in Asian Buddhist societies, because it's a principle of the universe, it's not something that you and I have to worry about. It's like everyone will receive the rewards. Well, again, rewards is not quite the right word. But as you act, it, it, you will be treated. That's built into the way the cosmos is working. So you and I don't have to worry about it. That's going to take care of itself. And it already is taking its care of itself right now because in principle, we are reborn and experiencing the consequences of our actions in previous lifetimes, right? What this means is, in effect, the whole karma teaching has actually encouraged a certain kind of passivity in, in most of the Asian Buddhist traditions, where they haven't been inclined to develop this in a kind of social justice way. If we want to find a term that corresponds to this term for social justice, I don't think there's anything better in Buddhist tradition than the most important term of all in Buddhism. Anybody want to uh, venture or give a guess or give your opinion on that? What's the single most important term in the whole of Buddhism, especially the early Buddhist tradition? What's the central concept? We have some monastics in the room. Don't mean, don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, anybody? That's great, because for me, that's number two, but it's not number one. <laughs> Sorry? Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, these are all essential, but they're not what I'm looking for. Freedom from suffering. Sorry? Dukkha, right? So, I mean, if you think about the Four Noble Truths, they're all about dukkha. Does everyone here know the term dukkha? It's the word usually translated as suffering, but actually that translation really only works if you understand it in the broadest possible way. Not just physical, mental pain, but dissatisfaction, anxiety, dis-ease, right? It refers to the fact that the way our minds usually work, it's, it's, it's their nature to be bothered by something, really. Um, and so the Buddhist way of looking at the world is not in terms of justice, but more in terms of suffering. How do we, you know, it's not about moral, moral justice, individual or social justice. It's about understanding suffering and where that, where that comes from and how we can alleviate that. But here's the interesting question. In fact, to me, this is a foundational question. What did the Buddha really have in mind when he was talking about the end of suffering? Because some people, some scholars, I'm thinking of people especially like Trevor Ling and a few others, uh, Nayland Suarez, some of these people believe that the Buddha actually wasn't just trying to create a religion in the sort of modern sense of the world, and that we should be very careful about sort of projecting our rather, or anachronistically projecting our rather enervated, weakened sense of what a religion is back onto the Buddha. You know, in the modern world, we have a particular understanding of religion. Let's be careful. Maybe that wasn't what the Buddha was at. Some of these scholars think that the Buddha may have had a much broader vision, that he was trying to start a movement that would transform society more, more basically. And in fact, there are two things that make me wonder if they were if they are right, and in fact, if the Buddha might have had a broader vision. The first is his attitude toward women, and the second is his attitude toward caste. So let me just say a little bit about those two things, right? Um, regarding women, remember that in his time, in Vedic religion, women were really 
I mean, if we think women are oppressed, they were really re oppressed. They couldn't do anything, especially in terms of anything spiritual, religious. They weren't allowed to chant the Vedas. Uh, I think they could have their tongue cut out if they did something like that. So it was a it was pr pretty nasty situation for women. And then the Buddha comes along and basically he says that women have the same potential to awaken as men. He starts a bhikkhuni sangha for the women. And we have all these wonderful songs in the Pali Canon talking about how indeed women uh, did wake up and how wonderful it was. So this, but again, something we kind of take for granted today, but in the context of 2,400 years ago, that was huge, huge, you know? There's something very, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the story of, of how the Buddha decided to admit women. Uh, but let me just say a little bit about it. Basically, um, the Buddha is beseeched by his foster mother who wants to join the order and you know, pursue the path to awakening. And he says no, and she chases after him weeping, no. Finally, Ananda, the Buddha's attendant says, well, he doesn't use the words, but he says in effect, look Buddha, or actually it's sort of world honored one or something like that. Uh, don't women have the same Buddha nature or the same potential to awaken as men? And the Buddha said, yes, yes, I've said that, it's true. And so Ananda says, well, why don't you create an order for them? Why don't you allow them into the Sangha? And the Buddha says, hmm, okay. And then he, he sort of adds some conditions to it. You know, he says, well, uh, just by accident, these conditions always make the women forever subordinate to men. And he also says, well, because of this, my Dharma is gonna disappear much more quickly. That's the story that's come down to us. And it's really important to recognize that it's, it's been totally distorted. Uh, there's all kinds of evidence within that story. Uh, for example, I used to appreciate the fact that, wasn't it neat that the Buddha would allow himself to be persuaded by Ananda, his young attendant? And then I realized, David, you're not thinking. In the Pali Canon, there's all kinds of stories about Ananda and they're all designed to show him in a bad light the redactors, the people who put it together, they really had it in for Ananda. Uh, clearly, f there was a kind of a power struggle and Kashapa, the guy who basically took over after the Buddha's death, he and Ananda, they, he really didn't like Ananda. I'm not sure why, maybe because Ananda was too close to the Buddha or something. So the fact that Ananda is the one who talks him, the Buddha into making the women's order that's a way of blaming Ananda for doing it, you see. And there's other problems too. For example, in the story, this story, this incident is believed to have occurred quite early in the Buddha's teaching career, seven, eight, nine years, something like that. But Ananda didn't become his attendant until late in life. So that part doesn't work very well. And there's some other problems as well. Some people think the rules that women are supposed to follow that subordinate them to men, there's some evidence they were added later, so all this kind of stuff. It's just a way of pointing out that as wonderful as the Pali Canon is, and especially the sutras, we have to be a little bit careful in the way we interpret it. The other issue is caste, um, which at the time of the Buddha evidently wasn't as strong as it became, but still, that was a... That, that was still a big issue. And one of the really important things about the Buddha's Sangha is that when you joined the Sangha, when you became a monastic, you lost caste. You, there was no caste in the Sangha. Kind of interesting, you know? There, there were no differentiations of caste within the spiritual institution that the Buddha created, which has sometimes been called the first, the uh, first democracy in history, right? And this reminds me of one of my all-time favorite stories from the Pali Canon, uh, where once there were some high caste Kshatriya men, Kshatriya were the princely, the warrior caste, like the Buddha, and they were going to, they decided that they wanted to join the order, that they wanted to become monastics. Uh, and so they turned to their attendant, Upali, not only their servant, but to be honest, probably something more like their slave, right? And they said, look, we're gonna take off our, our rich 
silk clothes and jewelry and we want you to bring this back to our families because we're not going to need them anymore as monastics, right? And Upali said, no way. If somebody finds me with these clothes and jewelry, what do you think they're going to think? They're going to think I stole them or killed you, so I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'll join the order too. So they all go together. I think it's a total of five or six of them. They all go to uh, the Buddha. And the Buddha does something really interesting. And you have to interpret it. It's not, it's not totally clear what's going on. But when they all present themselves to the Buddha and say that they want to become monastics, the Buddha, he, he takes the high caste guys uh, and he puts them on a retreat. I think it's like a two-week retreat. And I'm not sure why, but I think he wants to check them out. I think he wants to see, do they really have what it takes to, to be monastics? You know, they're kind of spoiled, young, rich guys. So let's check them out. But while they're on this retreat, he does something quite fascinating. He ordains Upali. He ordains Upali. What I forgot to mention earlier is that within the Sangha, Although it's democratic and there's no caste, there is one measure of um, sort of uh, preeminence. That is to say, when you are ordained. Because the person who is ordained earlier, uh, if, for example, they're moving around and they decide where to rest or when to start eating, the person who is the oldest in the Sangha has priority always. That's just a way to differentiate, decide who sits down first. What this means, in effect, is that Upali, their slave, will forever be their senior, their superior in the Sangha. That's, and again, think of it in that context of a caste-ridden society. Think what that means. Right? But what happened to the Sangha after the Buddha died? Maybe, and it's very hard to say, maybe the Buddha had this broader vision, but what in fact happened was after he was gone, well, first of all, the woman Sangha didn't last for very long. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that the men had control. And my guess is the men didn't like the competition. Curiously, after a couple hundred years, the women Sanghas tend to disappear. Um, serious problem there. And in fact, every Asian Buddhist society is strongly patriarchal in a way that I don't think the Buddha was. Maybe Taiwan a bit less than some because they have so many nuns there, but all very patriarchal. Um, and what about caste? Well, The early Sangha was, to some extent, dependent on royal support as well as royal toleration, right? We have stories of kings giving land and also providing financial support to the early Sangha, which needed it, right? It's still fragile, it's early days. So in addition to that, you're in a tricky relationship with the kings because if the kings don't like what you're doing, they can squash you very easily. And that, that, was, that was the tricky situation. So Buddhism did not, as far as I know, develop this kind of prophetic dimension of sort of challenging the kings. In fact, it came kind of to a, a prid quo, quid pro quo, in the sense that if you want to be supported by the powers that be, you'd better support the powers that be, right? And that's the way it developed historically. In other words, and, and you also have a teaching within the tradition that enables you to do this very nicely, the, the, the teaching of rebirth, right? So, somebody's born a king or a prince and becomes a king, well, you must have very good karma from your past lifetime. We should obey you because you deserve to be king. Somebody else is born poor, uh, maybe very disabled, well, I'm sorry, but don't blame anybody else. You must have done something bad in your past lifetime, right? And you are a woman. Well, I'm really sorry. You know, you must have done something really bad in your past lifetime. But if you do what we men say, 
if you obey us, then you have a good chance to be reborn as a man in your next lifetime, and then you can become a Buddhist monk and that, that sort of thing. I'm making a kind of joke, but as I understand the history, it's not so far from what actually happened. So in other words, Buddhism did not develop in a way that challenged the social order. It found a place for itself. It became institutionalized. It survived and thrived because it was accommodated within the social, within the institutional structures without challenging them. You know? So kings often took upon themselves the roles of, they looked upon themselves as Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and, uh, and the Sangha would tend to tolerate that. If the king calls himself a Buddha, as for example, the Chinese emperor sometimes did, you know, you've gotta be pretty brave to contradict him, right? So this is the way things developed. The good result of that is that because Buddhism focused only on individual karma, individual suffering, my own individual mind, it created and has been utilizing the greatest collection of contemplative practices that we've ever had. I mean, I think Buddhism has by far the greatest collection of those when you put all the different Buddhist traditions together. But again, the way that we've understood dukkha in Buddhism is it's very personal, it's very individual. Your dukkha is from your own karma and your own delusion, and it's individual. It's like the, the causal stream is, is, is just you. And that's what you work on, understanding how your own mind works. Liberation is freeing yourself uh, from your own individual suffering. But there hasn't been sufficient looking at the larger issue of what we could say, we could talk about as uh, institutionalized dukkha. Dukkha caused by problematical institutions, such as institutions ridden with caste and uh, patriarchy. The Buddhist tradition has not developed in that way, at least up to this point. That has not been the priority, right? But now today, we're in a new situation. And every time Buddhism has gone to a new culture, every time Buddhism has spread, it has interacted with the local culture and created something new. So we know in Tibet, it interacted with uh, the, the tantric Mahayana Buddhism that came, interacted with the native Bon, and something new was created, Tibetan Buddhism. China, Mahayana interacted with Chinese culture, especially Taoism, created Chan or Zen, the tradition that I practice in. So now Buddhism faces its greatest challenge and its greatest potential ever. It comes to the West. Or you can't even say the West. It comes to the modern world, because the West isn't just the West anymore. It comes to a modernizing, globalizing world. And it interacts with Christianity. It interacts with modern psychology. And it interacts with the Western concern for social justice and our insights into the fact that a lot of suffering that occurs in the world isn't just because of our own ways of thinking or our own karma, there's also suffering due to the way institutions function. Right? I can kind of sum this up by saying that I once heard a teacher say, and I won't say any more about who he was, but he was talking about, oh, how sad, how terrible, all the Jews in Nazi Germany, how terrible their karma must have been for them to be born at that time in that place. And I remember thinking, oh my God, you know, that, that kind of thinking, that's simply intolerable. We, 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 can't, we can't blame the victims in that way, right? We've really got to get beyond that. So we're in a situation now where the Buddhist concern to understand and alleviate dukkha it can start to engage with these larger questions. And it's not just a matter of taking on board the Judeo-Christian concern for social justice. It's also Buddhism has its own perspective that can help us to understand why suffering occurs. For example, one of the things that I've sometimes argued is that in the modern world, we've institutionalized the three poisons, institutionalized in the sense that they've taken on a life of their own. So our economic system is global, is Institutionalized greed, you never have enough. Not only consumers, corporations, never profitable enough, GNP never big enough. I think our 
militarism and our attitude, uh, our, our sort of prison, our attitude toward inmates in prison is kind of institutionalizing ill will. Interesting, we, have, we are by far the most militarized society in history if you look at the amount of money that we put into it. And the tragedy there, of course, is when you spend so much money on your military, uh, you've got to keep finding wars all the time. You've got to find enemies. How, how else do you rationalize all that money? That's why the end of the Cold War was a terrible problem for the Pentagon. But of course, it solved the problem. Now we have the war on terror, which can go on. It's already the longest war in history. It could go on forever. Maybe it never end. How would we know? You know? So. And likewise, I think we've institutionalized delusion with our media, which as mega corporations aren't concerned about educating or informing us. They're about um, finding ways to grab our eyeballs and sell them to the highest bidder. So they normalize consumerism. They don't really encourage us to ask the really vital questions. They sort of uh, keep us in a certain kind of mindset. So. No time here to go into that in any, at any length, but let me just conclude by what I really think I've been talking about is the importance of bringing together two types of freedom. Maybe they're not two types at all. Maybe they're two sides of the same freedom. Think for a minute. If Suppose, suppose you are the richest person in the United States. Maybe you're a J. Paul Getty or anyway, any really, really wealthy person. But if your mind is still filled and motivated by greed, ill will, delusion, would we Buddhists want to say that you are free? In some important sense, you are not. But one can turn that around as well, as well and look at, say, look at Burma, Myanmar, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a generation ago, although I'm not sure how much better things are now, really. But if you go back a little bit, and you have a military junta, which exploits everything for its own benefit, where people can't speak freely. A lot of people find it very hard to get enough food to eat. Are you really free there, even if you're an awakened Buddhist monk living in that kind of terrible situation where you can't speak freely, where your family's oppressed, and so forth? Can't we see today that we really need to work on both types of freedom. And in the modern world, where we are bring, you know, where globalization means that we know so much more about other traditions and we can see what they, we can learn from their ideals, their projects, but we can also bring them together with other projects. And as I said earlier, none too soon. I think we're in some pretty critical times now and I think we can use all the help we can get, all the insights from all of these traditions. So that's why I think that Buddhism and the modern world need each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for your, for your talk. So what I hear you saying is that the reason that, the, that Buddhism and the modern world need each other, or the ideal marriage, is a marriage between social justice and interiority, or some kind of, um, you could say, an external societal awakening and an internal awakening, that the ideal for a modern practice of Buddhism would be that. So my question is this. Both of those projects, for just the average individual, like let's just say an average individual, the project to become awakened on the inside and the project to be an activist on the outside with a concern for issues of equality and social justice, both of those projects could take a lot of energy. Either one of them could take a lot of energy on the basis, on the, on the, on the, on the part of one individual. I hope so. Yeah. So I guess my question is, and it's a question that comes up again and again. Someone asked the Karmapa this question a few days ago, maybe not worded in exactly the same way. How does a, an individual who cares about both of those things balance that? How can we do both 
well. Or should I go back there? Uh, no, stay here. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is this wonderful quotation from Nisargadatta that I like rather too much. I think I use it too often. Uh, but in effect, what he says is, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Between these two, my life turns. Uh, let me say it again, because what I think he's really articulating is what Buddhism sometimes calls the bodhisattva path that developed in, in Mahayana especially, right? And I think he also is pointing to why. It's, it's not simply that they both take a lot of energy. They actually, those two things, those two projects that you were talking about, I also believe they really need each other. Um, let me say it again first, though. When I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Between these two, my life turns. As far as Buddhism is concerned, when, when we, you know, why do we start Buddhist practice? Because for almost all of us, there's some problem, there's some dukkha in our own lives even if it's only sort of some kind of existential, what's it all about? There's some dissatisfaction that brings us to, you know, making this inordinate investment in time and energy and money in to, to, to practice. So that, that's a huge commitment. And we do it because there's something wrong in our lives. Our lives aren't working as well as we would like them to. But here's the interesting thing. As I understand awakening, it's about seeing through the delusion of separation. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, we're here to see through the illusion of our separation. The idea that somehow I am inside and all of you are outside, and therefore my well-being is separate ultimately from your well-being. So to start this practice, we, we do it in order to resolve our own issues. But as we get deeper into the practice, we if the practice is going well, we're also starting to see through this delusion of separation in realizing that my well-being isn't separate from yours. So the irony is if we still continue to just face the wall and do our own meditation and we think, oh, you know, what's important is about my own enlightenment. Leave me alone. Maybe when I'm fully enlightened, then I'll go out and help somebody. I think that misses the point, actually that attitude becomes the problem because it's still stuck in the dualistic way of understanding that my well-being is separate from the well-being of other people. You know? and, and I think Nisargadatta points to that. You know, when, I realize, when I look outside and realize that I am everything. And so the path of the bodhisattva, or in the modern world, the path of social and ecological activism, isn't something tagged on that we do when we're not practicing. It is we realize part of our practice. It's an essential part of our practice. We don't just do it because we're being kind and, and generous. It's essential, and we can understand it in another way too. As, as we begin to wake up, it, it doesn't mean that because I have some insight into the fact that I'm not separate from you, that doesn't mean that therefore all of my old self-centered habits and preoccupations automatically disappear. They're still there. So how do I, how do I begin to actualize or, or build into my life this insight that I'm not separate from other people? It's called learning to live a life of compassion. You know, it, it's definitely the bodhisattva path whereby the only way I really do that is I learn to live in, a world, in the world in a non-egotistical, non-narcissistic way, recognizing that the important question in a situation is not, you know, what's in this situation for me? You know, how can I get what I want out of this situation? That's the old dualistic way of thinking. But if I'm really starting to awaken and realize that I'm not separate from others, then it's, I am this situation. I'm not separate. I'm interdependent with all of you. What can I do to make this situation better for everyone? This is, th this is not only this not only means that I'm out there 
working to make the world a better place, it means this is my own personal practice to overcome my own dualistic, self-centered habits, which are my problem, you see. So in the important sense, I think that just as I was saying about East and West needing each other, I really think these two projects of personal transformation and my, our concern for social transformation really, really also need each other. Otherwise, we just become more self-obsessed, facing the wall, meditating, or the activist without the personal practice. It's so easy to get burned out and frustrated and disappointed. We need practitioners. We need people who, in the process of meditating, you know, they learn non-attachment, develop non-attachment, which we're going to need when we're dealing with social and ecological challenges. So it's a very long answer to your question, but there's so much built into the question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe one more uh, question and then we can open it up to the room for questions. Um, so um, I, I wonder sometimes, this is just my own wondering, um, when when I first encountered Buddhism, I encountered it in a Western context, and I believed for many years that Buddhism was about personal transformation. And then I went to Nepal, and I spent a year living with Tibetans in their context, and it completely changed my idea that this was about personal transformation just by seeing how Buddhism was active in the society, that there was a consciousness, that this was a tra transformative on a societal and an institutional level within the monasteries. There was a kind of attempt to create a sort of compassionate society within just the walls of one in, you know, monastery. So I now I wonder how much, I guess this is my question, maybe you've probably considered this, how much the idea that Buddhism is about personal transformation mainly is not a Buddhist idea, but a, a Western Buddhist idea. I just wonder if you think that or if, or if you think not. I think it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, part, part of the problem is sort of generalizing about Buddhism, isn't it? It's like there's so many different types of Buddhism, so many different threads which have been developed in, in very different ways. I mean, if we go back to the earliest text, the Pali Canon. <laughs> yeah, we should talk. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. I mean, the way my, my understanding of the early text, and I don't think it's simply my understanding, I think it's, it's sort of built in there. There are, there are tensions within the early canon, but What's the ultimate goal, right? If you think about it, the ultimate goal is uh, th this world of samsara is a world of suffering, craving, delusion, and so forth. And the idea is not to improve it or transform it in some way. The idea is to uh, transcend it by or escape it by not to being reborn. So I think there is this very, there is this, I'm not saying this is the only thing in Buddhism, but this, yeah, that that's very strong. Even then, that's controversial. There's, you know, if we wanted to spend the time, I think there's some things that can cast some doubt upon, or, you know, there seem to be different ideals and goals like going the on there. the bodhisattva ideal is to keep coming back as right. long as you can, or like to sort of prolong that for the sake of the suffering of the world. That's a different model. Right. That's usually associated with the development of Mahayana. Mm -hmm. And again, the way that's, again, it's kind of a Mahayana story why we're superior to the other guys, right? But the way that's normally explained is, of course, that they distinguish between the, the arhats, the enlightened people at the time of the Buddha, who they were awakened, but they were awakened for themselves, and they didn't have that sense of responsibility. And the idea of the bodhisattva path to be reborn and to help other people is, is predicated on following the example of the Buddha, right? Like the Buddha... He spent 45 years going all around trying to help everybody. And so that is talked about as what we should, what we should emulate. You know. 
within Japanese society, okay, I spent 20 years in Japan. Uh, it wasn't in a monastic situation, but, you know, in Japanese Buddhism, um, in Zen, th there is a lot of lip service paid to the bodhisattva path. We used to say every day the four bodhisattva vows, the first of which is, living beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. Well, lip service, but in terms of how things actually function, you know, uh, f first of all, it, it, not much was done to live up to that. And also, it was understood not in a social justice way. The bodhisattva path is usually understood as helping others wake up so that they are waking up rather than doing something that might be transformative, you know, on, on an institutional level. So, again, w without prolonging the answer, I think there's a lot of streams, a lot of Buddhist traditions, and it's dangerous for either one of us to generalize about that, but of course that's just what I've done in my talk. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we open it up for the group to ask questions of David, if you would like to. We have a mic hopper. Anyone want to be a mic hopper? Um, I really enjoyed your talk, David. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, what a, a broad a broader language of in grown up language around a western language around dukkha a conversation around dukkha that might be very constructive on both levels um, in terms of the social and the personal just because it just seems to me you know part of the problem with practice here is just this insane sort of application of buddhism as a way of sort of you know converging with a kind of consumerist idea that you know we can escape, eradicate suffering, and I, I just think it's, it's, it's a very self-defeating uh, and ultimately kind of narcissistic um, aspiration. Um, so, I mean, I think we're here to, we, I think suffering is, is here for good, you know. Um, thanks. Okay. Uh, and, and the Buddha himself, I mean, it's interesting, you go back to the early texts, there's this interesting parable about the two arrows, or sometimes called the two darts, you know, where, where, where the Buddha makes the point, the, the first dart of suffering, maybe physical suffering, you know, we're, we're all going to get old and, and die. Uh, we'll get old if we're lucky. As my dad used to say, getting old isn't so bad when you consider the alternative. Um, so... Buddhism doesn't stop that, but it's the second arrow of how we make pain into suffering by becoming obsessed with it and worrying about it and, and, and building it up. It's a very interesting story, you know, when you think, I think most of you are familiar with the, the foundational myth about the Buddha's life, that he was living in a palace and protected from suffering until, you know, one day he went outside and saw for the first time an old person, uh, then an ill person, and finally a dead person, a corpse, and that, that's what motivated him to go on a spiritual path and uh, eventually become awakened under the Bodhi tree. But it, and, you know, it's like he felt he had to do that in order to solve the problem of illness, old age, and death. And yet there's a kind of irony there. Um, so the Buddha was, in principle, you know, fully awakened. So then he goes out and he teaches for 45 years. What happens? Well, he gets old. He gets sick, and he dies. So, well, wait a minute. How did he solve the problem? Right? Or, or another way to say that, what is, what is the real problem? Some people have said to me that, you know, the word suffering doesn't really work very well because especially a lot of us in contemporary American culture, you know, we're very fortunate. We have great medical care and, and good lives, and suffering... But maybe that's not the best translation, as I tried to allude to at the beginning. Um, the way that I try to talk about it now is in terms of a sense of lack. And I explain that in the following way, that I think we can understand the Buddhist teaching about anatta, no self, as fitting into our contemporary understanding. The sense of self is a psychological and social construct, right? 
Uh, but the construction of a sense of self is at the same time the construction of that which is not self. It's like a sense of separation. It goes back to that delusion of separation. And that, that there's a fundamental discomfort or disease built into that situation. Or to say it another way, if the sense of self is a construct, it's inherently insecure. It's inherently uncomfortable because there's no thing there. There's no substantiality to it. It's just sort of patterns of behavior, processes that work together in a certain way. But because it doesn't have any reality, it's inevitably going to be insecure. And I think the way that we tend to experience that, something we all have, is a sense of lack. I think this, our sense of self is haunted or shadowed by a sense of lack, the feeling that something is missing, something isn't quite right, something is wrong with me. And I think that's one of the great secrets of life. We all have this sense of lack, but we don't realize that everyone else has it too. We think it's our own problem. And then we can look at the way our society sort of uh, conditions us in response, right? Our, you know, in a thousand years ago, you had the church. They tell you what your sense of lack is. It's sin, and they give you a way to deal with it. Well, maybe in the modern secular world, we don't believe in sin, but we still got a sense of lack. Well, what are we going to do? Well, no problem. We're conditioned as Americans. We know what our problem is. We don't have enough money, or we don't have enough consumer toys, or we're not famous enough. You know, Our society conditions us to understand our sense of lack and to try to fill it up by sort of getting enough money, getting enough fame, something like that. The tragedy being, of course, that if that external looking is only a symptom of the fundamental problem, this delusion of separate self, then all of those games that we're encouraged to play can't really make us happy. But I think if we look at suffering, if we look at the fundamental Buddhist teaching of dukkha in this way, it starts to make a lot more sense and of our condition today. And it also gives us a perspective on our society, you see, because it's not simply that you and I maybe are encouraged to become obsessed with money, but if you look at it from the other side, we can see we have a problematical society that is encouraging us to become obsessed with money and fame and things like that. So you can also use that as a way to understand and critique where our society is at. Does that help? Yeah, it also seems like a very a constructive way. It also seems like a very sort of constructive way for um, Buddhists and um, the Abrahamic practitioners to to communicate just because suffering is such a loaded term from that perspective, too. So my understanding is not that uh, we should simply import a kind of Judeo-Christian concern for social justice. There's a place for that. But nonetheless, Buddhism has its own analysis, as I've just tried to offer a little bit. I mentioned earlier the three poisons that we've institutionalized that have taken on a life of their own. I mean, I think that's, that's a Buddhist-type contribution. It's, notice it doesn't refer to morality. It's not an ethical. It's not talking about uh, distributive justice or anything like that. It's, it's talking about the delusions and the kind of suffering that uh, misunderstandings cause. Again, this fits in with the fundamental Buddhist approach, which is not dividing the world into good and evil, but understanding how you and I and all of us are parts of this system of delusion that institutionalizes suffering and how important it is for us to wake up to that. It's not, you know, today awakening can't simply be about waking up to my own, it's not just simply a matter of transforming my own greedy will delusion. I think it's really essential we have to see how they have been institutionalized in our society and work for that as well. In fact, I would go further and say that if that's the case, then we can see that uh, institutionalized greed, ill will, delusion are also a kind of spiritual, a collective spiritual crisis, a collective spiritual challenge. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the way you were bringing out the limitations of the, the aspect of good and evil from the Abrahamic traditions. And I think you were inferring um, when someone is awake um, that their moral compass becomes more uh, spontaneous in the way it arises. It's not sort of like you have to codify these rules. But we, I also get a little bit 
stumped when I think about sort of the institu institu institutionalization of our delusions and the fact that we do still need to have some sort of um, moral compass in, in the way we want to move forward. And I think as Buddhism has moved into the West or the modern world, it's, it's been sort of indoctrinated a lot with uh, the aspect of like a postmodern cultural relativism where we have a very difficult time making judgments around things and we kind of like to see things all equal. And, and, and that seems like a dead end too in a certain way. So, and, and I think the solution to that is in one way is quite simple. That is just speaking in terms of Buddhist institutions themselves, how, how important it is for Buddhist institutions to focus on the precepts, right? In, in other words, um, if someone, if you get fully, deeply enlightened, you don't need the precepts anymore because you automatically want to follow them. But that's okay. But nonetheless, the precepts are there, out there for all of us. And uh, if something happens and you're inclined to break them, you're going to be held accountable, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I think, I think the precepts in the Zen tradition, for complicated reasons, we haven't emphasized them enough. And I think that that is really important. In the Theravada tradition, I think they've done a much better job about emphasizing and, and holding the monastics in principle to those, to those precepts. Now, how much that's the complete answer to what you're calling for is another question. But certainly, that's, that's a place we have to start. Hello, Professor David Lloyd. Nice to meet you again. And thanks Welcome. for the wonderful talk. So my question is actually, uh, it has two parts uh, around the uh, increasing popularity of Buddhism in America. Like uh, one part is the Hollywoodization of Buddhism, like so many Hollywood stars, superstars embracing Buddhism. And another one is uh, uh, the popularity of mindfulness meditation, like when Thich Nhat Hanh comes, World Bank invites him, Google invites him, so, and uh, uh, Apple. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think are the implications of these, actually, uh, to Buddhism and also uh, in general in American society? Thanks. Yeah. Um, Because there is this element within Buddhism that does encourage us to sort of transcend this world, uh, I, I think there's some danger on the one hand of um, doing what I was arguing against, of, of sort of seeing our own well-being, our own awakening, our own salvation as sort of separate from the salvation of others. Uh, that, that's one problem. The other extreme, it seems to me, is understanding Buddhism simply in terms of a kind of mindfulness or simply in terms of sort of psychologically dealing with my own stuff in my own head, and if I just get that cleared away, then my life will be okay. What I'm trying to point to is I think there are two extremes. On the one hand, an extreme that sees the path about transcending this world and everyone else, and on the other hand, the extreme that thinks it's simply in, in kind of a Western, modern way, Buddhism is simply about helping us understand how our minds work. And if we simply understand how our minds work, then we will sort of fit into society better, we'll play our social roles better, and everything will be okay. What's interesting about those two extremes is that neither one of them really involves any sort of engagement with what's, go with what's actually going on in the society. Both of them sort of disconnect themselves from the kinds of social institutional dukkha that I was, that I was trying to refer to. That's why, that personally, I emphasize a way of understanding the Buddhist path as about deconstructing and reconstructing the sense of self, or more, preci more precisely, the relationship between myself and, and, and the world. Um, and if, if we look on it in that way, we can also say, well, it's not simply that I need to be deconstructed and reconstructed, but we can have a society that needs to be reconstructed so that it doesn't institutionalize dukkha. In most ways, I think the mindfulness movement is, is something very positive. You know, it, it, it's very beneficial to a lot of people, but there's also obviously dangers there if we think that somehow we're taking out the essence the best part of Buddhism, and simply we can ignore all the rest of that superstitious stuff. We're we're really missing we're really missing the point, 
And it's so easy for that kind of mindfulness to be used to simply make us more efficient workers, more profitable workers, and sort of fit into the system better and missing the point that the real Buddhist teachings, if we really know what's going on, they imply some very powerful critique, I think, of, of the dukkha that our institutions are creating. We're, we're getting low on time. Can we take a few more questions and then uh, I'll try to keep my answers shorter. Hello. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think you brought up some postmodern theoretical questions. It seems like with some Western discourses now, there's been this destabilization of the autonomous subject that kind of Buddhism has been pointing at for a long time. Like, there's no concrete like core to yourself. Um, and a lot of people have done social theoretical work around how the, the self is constituted collectively. Um, are there any social theoretical kind of strands that you think could help translate Buddhist practices, disciplines, uh, perspectives into social theoretical frameworks that can challenge institutional uh, forms of the three poisons? Because uh, I feel like in Western languages, this has been, been happening. Uh, looking at these things, not through this kind of right. self-other dichotomy, but in a much more nuanced way? Well, I mean, I think there's already a very rich di discourse going on, and I'm sure you know, you, I suspect you know more in more detail about you know, some of the people that are writing there. I think, so the, the essential point is what you say, that uh, you know, Buddhism is claiming that the, the the self, the subject, has always been decentered. That that it that it can never achieve the kind of stability or security that it's searching for, and 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 that's a kind of huge insight. I think what Buddhism mainly has to contribute, of course, is the contemplative practices. Right? I mean, it's not enough just to read French or continental uh, postmodern philosophy, although that can certainly play a role. But that it's really important to bring that into relationship with contemplative practices that actually help to deconstruct the sense of duality. And, and so I think that may be the most important thing that, that Buddhism has to offer there. Uh, what about a language for that? What about a language to describe the ways in which it's institutionalized? It's hard to strategize how to, how to, challenge, how to challenge that. It's like, they're, they're, where's the bridge? Great question. I don't see that Buddhism it, say, looking, for example, at ecological issues. I don't see that anywhere in Buddhist teachings that they give us an answer specifically what we should do. Like, should I join 350.org or should I work for a citizen's climate lobby? Well, I'm a member of 350.org. My Buddhist friend, Grant, works with citizen's climate lobby for a carbon. So, I mean, I don't see that Buddhism gives us those specific answers. Maybe it doesn't need to because there's so many organizations working in that direction. The main thing Buddhism offers, I think, is, is a lot of uh, guidance in terms of not what but how, you know, in terms of non-attachment, in terms of the importance of a contemplation practice that helps us deal in a non-attached way with the kind of frustrations that are inevitable, you know. Suzuki Shunryu, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, had this great line for his students. Uh, You're all perfect just as you are, but you all need a little improvement too. That's the two-sidedness of the bodhisattva path. We've got to keep going back to that I'm perfect, the world is perfect just as it is, that dimension, and yet not sitting in our butts and just living there, but also bringing that... that um, serenity, that, that emptiness, that, that, uh, that potency, that awakening into social engagement. And it's, it's the combination of the two that I think is a very powerful, powerful. Uh, did you want to follow up on that one in particular? Because um, there's other, other people too. Yeah, I just had a quick question to sort of follow up on that. And that would be, um, is interdependence perhaps one way of bridging the in individual when the Karmapa was here? A few days ago, he began by saying the essence of the Buddhist teachings, the real essence of the Buddhist teachings is interdependence. And that both is, addresses the 
the way that we are not separate and the way we think we're separate, but it also emphasizes interconnectivity and the way karma can actually be a constructive concept for yeah. effectiveness. So, in other words, I think we need to reconceptualize karma as not individual, but that, you know, exactly that. But of course, talking about interconnectedness is simply the other way of talking about no self. Again, it, it's, it's important, but it doesn't give us easy answers to the old question, should I join 350.org or should I work for carbon tax? So, I mean, I think it's still there. There were two more people who wanted to ask questions and I didn't want the two of you to be cut off, so we'll try to. Hi, David, thanks for being here with us today. Um, you've spoken a lot about social transformation and how that relates with, with Buddhism. I was hoping that you would say a few more words about uh, the ecological crisis mm -hmm. and how, what you view Buddhism's role to be in addressing that and in environmental justice, what particular resources you, you think that Buddhism has to offer and what particular challenges you also see. In, in 10 words or less, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, given the time, we can chat a bit afterwards. There, there's a couple things that I would point you to reading. There's a, the latest tricycle has a long section on eco-dharma, where one, my article tries to speak to that. And there's a longer essay by me called uh, Healing Ecology, where I, I try to focus on the parallels between our individual predicament, sense of separation, and our collective. So in a way, it tries to point in that direction. That doesn't deny the, the problem that we just focused on. Uh, uh, I think it gives us a lot of insight from a Buddhist perspective exactly where the source of the problem is. It doesn't necessarily help us very particularly in terms of precisely should I do this or should I do that. I mean, one thing I think we can say though, Let's face it, folks, we're in a difficult situation, okay? I think you know it. I don't think you need me to tell you that, ecologically and socially and economically. The world is starting to change dramatically, and we're going to have some huge... What I mean by that is I think we are all in a situation now where we are being called upon or will be called upon to become bodhisattvas. That It's like that's going to become the only game in town, maybe very quickly, you know? So I think that that's something... It's like thinking of our path as something sort of marginal, I think in a way this may be the only thing that has any meaning anymore as, as things really start to close down. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't answer your question. It's a wonderful question. It's just a very rich one. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. And um, he also, David, leads wilderness retreats. And I have some handouts here. Um, if you're interested on a wilderness retreat, he's leading um, in August of this year. So thank you so much, David, for coming. Thank you.